This is the place where, as often as not, legends are created. And we've come here today to meet a Monaco resident and a Monaco winner, and a man who overcame fearful injuries to become a double world champion and the latest of our legends of Formula One. Mika, thanks for giving us an excuse to enjoy the best view in <laughs> motorsport, one of the best views in the world. You've lived here for quite a while now, haven't you? Yeah, I've been living here 20 years. <clears throat> when I started my uh, Formula One career, I decided to move down here in Monaco, and it was, a, it was a right decision. Yeah. What's it like to live here when you've actually won the race and you've got a certain amount of status and you can wander around these streets knowing that you, you, you were the man who took pole position and won the Monaco Grand Prix? Yeah, it is, it is quite, a, quite interesting, you know. I moved down to Monaco 91, and I know all the streets, you know, and, and uh, I got the only victory here in Monaco in 98, so it took quite a, many years to get the victory here in Monaco. When there is no Grand Prix here, it's, 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 very, it's quite quiet, yeah. uh, and uh, driving to streets, which are part of the Grand Prix track, it, it, it brings all the time memories. I said, oh yeah, that corner, you know, how I was braking and how close to I going to barriers and good memories. Yeah, it makes the morning shopping trip a little bit more exciting, doesn't oh, it? Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and of course, they're in the final stages of preparation for, for the Grand Prix now yeah. and uh, the historic Grand Prix as well. This is a special time in the Principality, isn't it? It is, it is. Everything changes, you know, the building grandstands and building the the barriers around the track, uh, uh, all the advertisement boards. It's a major work here. Mm. And, and, uh, and yes, they do the history Grand Prix first, and then a couple of weeks later is the Monaco Grand Prix. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's incredible what they can do in this small city. And, and what is amazing also is still the city has to go on, the life has to go on, the public roads has to be open, and business has to go on so they they're doing a good job here and of course in the Grand Prix itself you've been retired now what for the best part of 10 years yeah in the Grand Prix itself we got your old rival Michael Schumacher does it ever make you think that did I get the timing right yeah I mean the retirement was uh, I feel it was definitely the right decision uh, but of inside myself of course I feel feel like uh, racing is is number one and it's really fantastic it would be nice to be back in in motor racing, but I had to be realistic. You first got in a car, what, about five, six years old? Was there motor racing around the family? Was it in the blood at all? Uh, my my parents, parents did not have any motor racing background. It <coughs> uh, was a little bit from my mother's side in a, in a family. They had a little bit motor racing background, but nothing serious, to be honest. Uh, but go-karting and motor racing in general in Finland is a very big sport. So I, I got involved uh, uh, go-karts when I was around five, six years old. And, and I got a spark. I got the spark. I said, this is it. I, I like this. Of course, I tried everything else. I tried football, ice hockey. But all these, like uh, ice hockey, more or less that time, you were able to only play on the winter time. Yeah. Football only at the summertime. Uh, so biggest interest I got from the motor racing. It was really good fun. I would say I was a very aggressive driver. You know, my, it was not really fighting against the clock. Uh, it was more or less just going around the corner as fast as possible. And, and to be, to do that, you have to be aggressive. It depends, of course, a little bit what kind of category car you have. If you have very creepy tires, uh, is more challenging, especially when you're racing in Europe. But in Finland, with very slippery conditions on a, on a, on a go-kart track, so you have to be aggressive. You have to go flat out, sideways all the time. <laughs> that was always your start. Yeah. <laughs> but one of the big breaks you have in the early 80s was to, was to link up with Keke Rosberg, a Formula One world champion who gave you backing, support, and how did that come about? Well, I started go-karts and then I moved to a category called Formula Ford. <clears throat> and I won everything, more or less. I won the Scandinavian Championship, Finnish Championship, 
And that time I had uh, sponsors. One oil company, Neste from Finland. I had a GWS. And, and the owner of the GWS, Karjo Sulberg, uh, was a very good friend of me, friend of my family or my parents. Uh, so he had a good connections and he knew Keke really well. And he said to Keke one day, Someone, come on, take this, take this young guy, this Finnish guy, he's, he's bloody quick. And I think Keke was not so interested about that time because he had a JJ Lehto from Finland already. He has some auto athletics in his management. And I, he thought, okay, one is enough for him. But some reason, uh, I think they did some arm wrestling and, <laughs> and Keke lost and, and, and Keke said, okay, let's, let's, give, let's give this Finnish guy a chance. And, and what sort of input did he have? What did you actually learn? How did he guide you forward? Oh, Keke, so Keke was a really tough guy, you know, and, and uh, he, he really educated me for the big world. Not about the, just the Finland or Scandinavia racing. He educated me that way, okay, mm. if you want me to manage for you, now you have to learn these certain rules. The time changed to be a professional racing driver, not to be a driving just for hobby. Mm. And, and uh, he educated me really well, because Keke knew from his career that driving is such a small percentage of the total business. You know, there's a lot of other elements what you have to do to become a professional racing driver. Relationship with sponsors is, yeah. is all important, and you carried those colours. Um, to success in the British Formula 3 Championship, yeah. which is where we, you first came to our notice. You won it in 1990. 1989, you, you really came to our attention with a bit of a moment at the bomb hole at Snetterton. Yeah. Uh, that was quite a serious one, wasn't it? That was serious. That was, that was unbelievable, I tell you. Uh, and and, and uh, it, it was incredible because uh, that time, you know, the safety was not so, uh, so good in racing cars yet. Yeah. Uh, and I did roll the car. The Formula 3 quite badly, and, and uh, luckily, luckily I get out of the car without hurting myself. And uh, it was just a, it was just a crazy corner, you know. You, you go down the hill a little bit, then you come up again, and it, it turns in quite, quite sharply on the right, and, and you, you go there flat. You can Formula 3, you can go just flat through that corner, because top of the hill the car gets a bit light, and uh, the car spun in front of me. And I did not have no chance to try to pass him inside. I had to go outside. But because he spun, he starts sliding backwards. So I have to go more or less leave it on the grass. And that's it. Pshh, straight in the barriers. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> Exit on all fours. <laughs> oh, yeah. That was so you know, horrible. And it was the first occasion, I think, you came um, to experience the medical backup that the sport is capable of. First time you met Sid Watkins as a result of that, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, I felt okay after the accident. I said, okay, everything is, I feel good. I said to the team, I, f I, I feel good. But, but then a, uh, Philip Morris and the team, what I was racing that time, they said, Mika, you, you have to go to check out in hospital in London with Sid Watkins. I went to see Sid and Sid and said, in his office and he said, sit down, please. I said, okay, I sat down and said, he asked me, are you okay? I'm, I'm okay. He had a cup of coffee and said, Mika, smell this. And I said, I said, yeah, it's coffee. All right, you are fine. <laughs> but anyway, he did certain checks to make sure. But yeah. uh, it was interesting to see his way of working. You know. Man of instinct. Yeah. Well, six years later, the, uh, the medical attention you required was a little bit more intense, but that's another story. Uh, uh, yeah. Into Formula One uh, with Lotus and, and sort of learning years, difficult years. Uh, what was that experience like for two years? Oh yeah, it was uh, it was an unbelievable two years. It, it was uh, very very hard. Uh, Team Lotus in that time was in a very difficult situation. You know, Martin Donnelly had a bad accident in mm. Jerez uh, one year or two years before that. So Lotus went <laughs> downhill flat out. Uh, so, Mr. Collins, the, the Australian guy, took over the team, but the team didn't have a lot of money. Even the testing, when I went to Team Lotus, and before we start the season, we did maybe two or three times test, and, and even those times, the, the car was not running properly. And the time when it was running properly, it was raining so much, we hardly, hardly could have <laughs> done any testing. But uh, when we went the first race in Phoenix in 91, it, it was amazing, you know. I qualified, I think I was 13th, 
and the car was overweight, 50 kilos. Uh, that's because we didn't make a new chassis, they just made the old chassis stronger. Yeah. But of course, there's always penalty of the weight. Well, it was 50 kilos overweight, so it was impossible to make a good performance. All the way through that year, it was really hard, you know. Uh, but some reason the team wasn't 100% happy with me. Uh, that's impression I got. Really? And uh, you were scoring points. You were, you were almost outperforming the car. Exactly. But uh, I think the team was asking too much from me. You know, the management should have given me more knowledgeable advice, not just saying that way. You know, you have to be better. Basically, that's not enough. You need to have a give the direction how to do it. But I think in, the, in those two years, 91, 92, you were proving a lot to, to the pit lane about your own ability, and, and yeah. the call came. Um, how did you end up at McLaren as a, well, it was sort of a third driver, a test driver is how it turned out, but there's a bit of contractual stuff flying around, wasn't there? Well, because of 92, I did pretty good results with Lotus, even we weren't that competitive, but for some reason I was scoring points, uh, nearly finished in podium in in Hungary, so the teams got interested. There was quite a few teams, Ligier, Williams, McLaren, a lot of teams was contacting and said, oh, come on, we want Mika to drive for us. It was, came time to make a decision, what I'm gonna do. Uh, I had to look what, what team would be the best me to go. And if you look the history of McLaren, it's unbelievable. Mm. So I said, that's it. And uh, Ron was happy to take me. But Ron said, you know, maybe to Arton, we'll continue with this 93. So maybe you end up to your test driver. Yeah. And uh, that's what happened. It was horrible. It was not long before the first race uh, in Kualami when, when, the, when the Ron said, you know, Mika, sorry, no racing. You will be test driver. But he said, Mika, I promise you, you will be racing with us. Mika Hakkinen started the 1993 season as a McLaren test driver. He had a front row seat to observe the contrasting styles of Ayrton Senna and the American Michael Andretti, son of the 1978 world champion Mario. Michael Andretti is a, is a, it's a very good racing driver. There's no problem with that. Uh, Formula One, you just don't come there and you're racing and then you go home with the trophies in your hand. You know, you had to do massive sacrifices in your life. Michael was living that time in USA, so he was flying from USA to come into Grand Prix. Oh, that doesn't work. Well, clearly Michael Andretti wasn't going to last, and he was gone after the Italian Grand Prix at Monza. In you came for, for Estoril, Portuguese Grand Prix, and immediately out-qualified Ayrton Senna. Uh, and how satisfying a moment was that? It was, it was really good, because before the Portuguese Grand Prix, I did quite a few tests with, with uh, Ayrton at the same time, and, and every time Ayrton was quicker than me in the testing. But I knew that the uh, performance of the cars were not the same. We were testing completely different items in a car, so I knew that it was obvious Ayrton was able to go faster. And I knew also why they let him be a little bit faster too. <laughs> so when I went to Portugal, I was very confident that way I could not go flat out and I have, a, I have a chance to do the great result, but <clears throat> to be a faster than Ayrton, uh, I was confident inside I can do it, but I wasn't sure is it gonna happen. So, so when the qualifying happened and I was faster than him, it was amazing about the people, how they reacted. They were really amazed, surprised, and I was like, you know, this is, this is normal. But Ayrton was three times world champion always been the fastest man on the track, all past the history, uh, before even I arrived to Formula One. So what was his reaction? Congratulations, so, well done, young man? Or? He was amazed. Uh, I think there was a more or less one corner only where I was quicker, which was the first corner. It was nearly flat, you know, just lift a little bit and go back on the gas. And I was there quicker than him, just half a tenth or something, not a lot. And. Uh, I went to the garage and Arthur came to talk to me. I said, oh, 
What did you do? How you work quicker than, you know, what did you do? But he put you sort of in, in your place a bit when it came to the race and his race craft. And just being around Ayrton during the course of that year must have taught you a lot, I'm sure. Yeah, it, it, it's definitely, but going back a little bit, I, I learned a lot from Ayrton. You have to be a tough guy to be there. You just kind of go there and smiling and, and having fun. No, you have to really focus and you have to know your place. Uh, but uh, our relation with Ayrton and me wasn't very good. It got really difficult uh, relation at the moment when I was quicker than him in a qualification. He understood I'm the threat. Uh, and it took, it took uh, the rest of the season. It was a massive fight, you know. Suzuka, I couldn't be quicker than him in a qualifying unless I had make mechanical failure. But Australia, he was definitely faster. But it was only one corner where he was quicker. Uh, but that's enough. Uh, but, but then, relation changed when he went Williams in '94. We had an incident in uh, in Ida in Suzuka. I pushed him off. Of course, not purposely. In the start. So after the race, I went to see him. I said, you know, I'm really sorry. I didn't mean to do that. I was so pissed off. He was so angry for me. I said, come on, man. You know, I didn't do it purposely. You know, things happen. <laughs> and then. Then he came, you know, we went the same flight back to Europe after that, and he came to see me and started talking to me. I think he understood that way he was not behaving correctly, you know. And after that, everything was very good. But then after, you know, then so what happened was, and after that was... There wasn't, wasn't a great deal after that, yeah. which, was, which yeah. was the tragedy. But you were a McLaren race driver, uh, and they were tough years for McLaren compared to what had gone before, 94, 95, 96. Um, how did you see the morale within the team and the, and the whole sort of spirit within the team? Because you went through, what, three different engine suppliers yeah. and different tyre manufacturers yeah. and everything. McLaren was winning. They were dominating in 1988, 89, 1990. So suddenly, <laughs> no results. And I was living in that path with McLaren. And like, you know, we had we had a we had a Ford engine. We had a we tested Lamborghini engine. <clears throat> we had a Peugeot engine, and then finally Mercedes. Uh, so every time when you change the engine in a car, you know you have to change the hydraulic, the cooling, the design of the car, the gearbox. So million things. So it was a very difficult to get the results. You know, either mechanical failures or the performance wasn't good. So very difficult time. But Ron Dennis said to me, he said, Mika, you will win with us. You will be world champion, you know? And I look at him and I said, okay, let's fight. Let's go through this, this difficult time. And I, I trust you. But did you really believe that? Believe that because it was McLaren? I believe that. I believe him 100% because the history talks. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, the Ron was always uh, working on perfection. But Ron always, and I learned to understand that way, you don't change things overnight. You know, you have to wait, you have to get the right people, you have to get the right engine. And finally, when we got the Mercedes, we started getting stronger. And finally, when we got Adrian Neue, we got really strong. Yeah. And then, then the happy day started. Yeah. But <laughs> before all of that, at the back end of 95, came your huge accident in, yeah. in, in Australia. How much do you recollect of the incident, if anything, uh, the, the, the very graphic aftermath as well? Yeah, it was awful. It was really difficult. Uh, 95 was a really hard year. Uh, Mercedes had a high expectations for the results. Car didn't work really well in 95. Also, what happened with Nigel Mansell, he arrived to the team, but didn't, didn't least last too long. Uh, very difficult, yeah. And then, then the accident. I mean, wow. Uh, there was a tire explosion. Uh, and of course, it was in the most horrible corner where the speed is really high. Uh, so I hit the barrier, cracked my skull. Uh, but there was a good thing. There was just a medical 
team was just in that corner, based. Hospital was 200 meters away, so there was a lot of positive things. Uh, but that really, that really, I think, helped me to appreciate the life. <laughs> uh, it helped me to slow down. And, and I, afterwards, when I've been thinking about it, it felt like before my accident, I was, I was always running flat out without really didn't know how to walk. So uh, it teach me to learn to walk first and run after. Yeah. So, so I was more relaxed after and I was... But all that took, took a while uh, and it was a tough few weeks, I'm sure. Um, at the time of the accident, I mean, they saved your life with a tracheotomy for, oh, yeah. for sure. Um, what are your recollections of that and, and the way you reflect on that? Well, when I lost the control, I remember when I lost the control. And I remember when I was in a car, I couldn't move. You know, I tried to move, but I had no chance. So I just decided to just relax. <laughs> That's what comes to my mind. And then, then the doctors came and then I passed out. And in the hospital, they kept me sleep overnight uh, because I cracked my skull. So they had to do certain things to keep me still and, and not to, otherwise if I wake up, I start panicking or something. And uh, I woke up, the family was flying over to Australia. Uh, but team, Ron, Ron did everything to protect me. Uh, and also the Ron's wife was there, Lisa, and they came to see me and I think they were quite terrified to see what I look like. Uh, it was awful, awful time, yeah. you know, to feeling and, so ill. Yeah, and, and, and the physical treatment, because I think you were still in Australia, what, a month later? Yeah. Uh, and that was tough, wasn't it? Yeah, I was what about... What you had to go through then? Yeah, I was, I was about a month in, in, uh, in, in Australia in a hospital and, and going through all kinds of tests, you know. Uh, you know, cracking the skull, you know, it's, it's not fun, you know, uh, because it's because you have all the senses and everything for the smelling and taste and your vision, your hearing. Uh, everything has to be checked that everything is functioning correctly. And every day, constantly testing. Uh, I don't want to tell the details, but yeah, <laughs> it, it, it definitely was a very hard time. And, and it was, what I remember, it was just constantly waiting, painkillers, tablets all the time. To, to take the pain away. And massive headaches. Couldn't walk, couldn't go anywhere, so... Uh... But how soon during the course of this process were you starting to think about racing again? It took a really long time. Uh, I just wanted to live. I just wanted to get rid of the pain. That was the main purpose of my, my, my feeling that time. There was no any interest of the motor racing. And it took a long time uh, to start thinking about it, even motor racing. It was just important that way I can walk and, and talk normally and, you know, and sleep normally. And that was the, just the main thing. And, and it makes me to understand how fragile the life is. You know, you live only once. And, and uh, there's so many good things in a life that way, you know, when something like that happens, it makes you think that's it, the, the life is, you know, this is over. Mm. Getting in the car and going fast again, uh, and going as fast as you were going during the course of 95 uh, as well, what sort of demons do you have to overcome to be able to do that? Very difficult, very difficult. I mean, uh, 95, uh, going to 96, 97, the team was pushing so hard for the new technology, uh, new ideas for the suspension, for the steering, uh, all kinds of things. That way, when we went testing, we had quite a few failures, you know, going flat out on a straight line and rear suspension brakes and you go 350, you know, it's, that's, that makes you think again, like, Mika, Mika, come on, what are you doing, you know, you know. <laughs> but then something says in the head that way, you know, I have a mission here. I've been doing this sport all my life. I'm here to win, you know, let's continue until that happens.
Having made a miraculous recovery from his crash in Australia, Mika was back racing again in 1996. By 97, Adrian Newey, having joined from Williams, was having an immediate impact on car design, helping to provide the vital ingredients for Hakkinen to achieve his world championship ambitions. Adrian Newey was a very important part of the uh, achievement what the McLaren did uh, in, in uh, 98 and 99 and after that. To compare the car in 97 and 98, was massive difference and it was the car was more detailed uh, it was uh, aerodynamically an uh, amazing package uh, way to all the end plates were designed all the wings and the bodywork and also the design in the, in the cockpit itself and uh, it always worked in detail and he was always focused on numbers you know when we were designing and changing anything it was calculation of things uh, for him it was so important nothing was it was not about okay let's do this let's do that no it was a purely calculation okay it took quite a long time said, okay we do this <laughs> and it worked and, and it's, it, it worked always very logical way. And you also came into 1998 as a race winner, at long last. Yeah. Uh, it had taken a while, but yeah. that breakthrough win was at the back end of 97. And it wasn't quite the circumstances that you must have imagined that your first victory was going <laughs> to come in. Um, remind us of what happened. That was, yeah, it was uh, Jack Villeneuve, Michael, last Grand Prix in Jerez, and they had a massive fight you know Michael has to win the race and and they had a quite a bad incident in the race and I think Michael got the penalty out of that soon that when that accident happened which was not maybe about 15 laps before the end uh, Michael went off Jack was able to continue but I think Jack understood that way it's no point to push anymore no. and uh, I think he was not sure anymore if the car was okay because they touched so, of course, I come in flat out with David. And I think it was a last lap, I overtook uh, Jack. And uh, it, was, uh, it was a terrible feeling because uh, I knew that way, if something goes wrong, and I crash with him one way or other reason, you know, it would be a catastrophe. In terms but of the world championship. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And uh, well, I think Jack led me to go, basically. He didn't want to fight at all. And uh, I got the first victory. Yeah. It was brilliant. But as the season evolved, you, you started reeling off some more conventional victories uh, and establishing your place at the top of the championship. And then a resurgent Michael Schumacher came along to challenge you. Yeah. And, and, and how was the rivalry between you and Michael developing at that time? What did you see in Michael? What was the particularly threatening aspect of Michael Schumacher as an opponent? Well, racing against the Michael, the race was never over until the chicken flag. So you never couldn't take it easy. You never couldn't slow down. You never couldn't, you never, he was always fighting to the last chance what he had. Uh, even he did not have a great package in 98 until the end of the year, they start developing, getting better. Uh, it, was, it was really tough again. Never underestimate him. Michael was so tough. Because you'd already produced just about the performance of the season at the Nürburgring in, in, yeah. in what was the, the Grand Prix of Luxembourg. And yeah. perhaps that rates as your outstanding performance. It was you and Michael head to head really for the title, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, that was a turning point of the season, in my opinion, because if I were to lose that, it would be a really, really tough. When we went to final to Suzuka, I was some reason so confident. I was confident because team gave me the confidence. Team gave me the trust that way, Mika, you can do it. Mika, we will do everything for you that way you can do it. And I felt like, that's it. I'm gonna do the same. Mm. So I'm gonna go, I'm gonna make a perfect weekend. And uh, it was unbelievable, you know. I had to win the race. Uh, and I think Michael was in pole. <clears throat> I think he was in pole, yeah. He yeah. was in pole, just the just marching. 
But I know, I knew that we're in race configuration, we are better. So uh, before the start, I really figured it, I tried to figure it out how I can do this, how I can win it. And suddenly it clicked in my mind. I said, now I know what I have to do. Uh, so I put all my concentration, all my energy, only in the start, nothing else. And the warm-up lap to make sure the car is warm, the tires are good and everything. So I was only focusing for that. I didn't think about the first lap or second lap or whatever. And uh, it worked out fantastic. Michael had a problem. <laughs> Michael had his own problems, didn't he, as well? But, yeah. Uh, I mean, the feeling of satisfaction at the end, I mean, not only from your point of view, you'd only become a, a race winner uh, a season earlier, but in the context of everything that had happened in Australia in 95, and also the fact that it had been such a lean period for the team as well. Yeah. The feeling at the end of that race must have been astonishing. It was incredible. I don't know, you know, even when Michael was out, I saw him on a track, I saw him on the screen, I knew that's it, you know. And I said, you know, I was calling radio, he's, you know, Michael is out now, and Ron just said, Mika, focus, concentrate, it's not over yet. You know, it was very, again, I never forget that because it was important to finish the race and win the race. But uh, going around the, after the race to the lap around the track, it was an amazing moment, uh, the feeling inside, the relief. Uh, coming to the pits, Coming out of the car, I didn't know is this real or not. Is this because it took so many years? It's horrible. You know, it took since '91, and finally, seven years later, the victory comes. Having realized his dream of becoming world champion in 1998, Mika went into the 1999 season looking to become only the sixth man in history to join the list of greats like Ascari, Fangio and Brabham to win back-to-back -back world championship titles. But the 1999 season proved to be even more nail-biting than the previous year. At the end of the 98, I was really busy. You know, all the promotions, marketing, around the world, and I mean, Jesus, I mean, I was so busy. <laughs> and I didn't really have time to sit down and think about it, what happened, you know. So, uh, I think uh, I should have been more clever uh, and say, that's it, guys, you know, I cannot do this. Yeah. Because the whole year was so intensive, so hard, so I needed to break. Immediately after the season, flat out promotions, and I was one month on the road. Mm. all over the place. I didn't know anymore which country I was going into, you know, it was so fast. So uh, the, the time to have a time off and come back to the testing, it was, it was not good. Yeah. And uh, when we started year 99, the regulations changed a little bit, the tires changed, the chassis changed. And uh, we had a quick car in 99, but again, it was it's so much in the edge. So the reliability was a little problem. The car was so difficult to try. It was quick, but so difficult. So I knew that way, even we had an advance in start of the season, I knew it's not going to take long. Yeah. Michael, will, Michael will catch us sooner or later. But then he had his incident. He broke his leg at Silverstone. Yeah. And you must have thought at that time, well, that's it, the championship is ours once again. But it, it wasn't going to be as easy as that, was no. it? It was so sad what happened to Michael, uh, and and uh, I thought that's this is this is gonna make the season easier, but it 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 it, it was not easier. You know, I had again unbelievable situations. Uh, I think I had a situation with David in Austria. Austria. Yeah, you came together. Yeah, yeah. that was uh, that was catastrophic. Plus, of course, you had Eddie Irvine, who was finding his form and was, yeah. a, was a strong opponent, wasn't yeah, he? Yeah, he was always shadow of Michael, and now finally he got uh, attention from the team. And, and, uh, and I think the, the Ferrari was in also on a good way of developing a car. And similarly at Monza, the pressure was increasing. Eddie was, was 
getting the results and getting the points as well. And, and another driver mistake and a reaction which, I mean, was, was... I don't know whether you look back on those pictures with uncomfortably, with regret, or what sort of emotions were you feeling at that time? Clearly you were overcome with the implications oh, yeah. of, of, of the mistake. I had a massive fever before the race. Uh, uh, I was not feeling so good, but I didn't want to tell that to anybody, so it just created to other, yeah. you know, discussions. So I just said, I'm quiet. And it was really hot in Monza. Uh, again, the car was quick, but it was difficult to drive. I was leading comfortably, and I spun. Not very high speed. In a gravel, and of course got stuck, you know, because the right height in Formula 1 is so low, so... It sank in the sand, and no chance to get out. And I was so angry for myself, so angry, and, and uh, I was so disappointed of myself. I was a world champion, and I should not do mistakes like that. You got out of the car. It was clear that you wanted to have a private moment somewhere. <laughs> yeah. If you could have slammed the door of a caravan, we yeah, all understood what was happening behind. But do you look back on those pictures uncomfortably, or this is what the sport is about? This is yeah, what it I means mean, to you. I think it's. I don't think it's a mistake to show your emotions. I think it's a. It's a very important to show your emotions uh, uh, when you're disappointed. Uh, but in that time, there was too much. Before the race, I had a fever. I lost a lot of liquid. It was a very heavy, hot Grand Prix, very important Grand Prix. And uh, that, that made me just, uh, I was disappointed myself. I should have been more clever. So after crashing out in Monza and finishing only fifth in the European Grand Prix at the Nürburgring, the championship came down to the final two races of the season, with Mika and Eddie Irvine still vying for the title, but with a fit again Michael Schumacher, now back in the other Ferrari. Well, Malaysia was a special, you know, yeah. that was unreal. And that was the toughest race ever I had done in Formula One. And, and I was quicker than Michael, uh, but he just, he closed the door everywhere, you know, and, and he was pushing in the corners where he knew I had opportunity. And the corners where I didn't have opportunity, he was not so quick for some reason. So uh, uh, I ended up third. Eddie first, Michael second. And of course, there was a big discussion about the aerodynamics, what they had in that car, in that race. They had the end plates, or what they were called, end plates in the side of the car, which was not correct. So again, from that Grand Prix, the final race in Suzuka was very difficult because there was a protest going on, did not know what happened. So Michael was, uh, he did a good job, but uh, in last race, it didn't work out. Well, DC did, did a pretty good job on him in that yeah. final race in Japan, yeah, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That was absolutely. terrific support. The feeling when you were world champion once again, the feeling of successfully defending the title was what? Finishing the championship in the last Grand Prix is the hardest what can ever happen. Uh, I said to David, you know, we had a dinner uh, after the Grand Prix in Suzuka. And I said to David, just come on. Next year is your turn. I cannot do this anymore. I was so tired. I was. I could not believe it. How much energy, the effort it takes to win the world championship. It was. It was awful. So at that time, were you starting to think, this is it? I'll draw a line under it. There's maybe one season left, two seasons left. Were you thinking retirement at that point? I probably back in my mind there was a feeling that way. You know. Energy is finished. I mean, I have no any more energy to to perform, uh, and I <clears throat> I felt that way. You know, I'm here to win, and if I'm not do 100% job, I don't do favor for the for the team, not for the fans. So then it's better to step out. But uh, when we went to year 2000, I was still I was still motivated. Michael was a very, very difficult competitor. He never gives up. And, and the Spa was, I think, was a good example, you know. Uh, I was leading a race, again, quite comfortably, and I made, a, I made an error because the circuit was a little bit still damped, and, and I hit the one curb and I spun. 
And what that meant, you know, the Michael got the lead and, and he got quite a comfortable lead. And I have to start chasing him, you know. And uh, it was fun. It was really good fun to, because I knew I'm so much quicker than him. So the always taking should be quite easy. But it was not easy. You know, it was not easy end of the day because the place where I had a chance to overtake him was just going up to a ruse and a long straight. And every time when I tried to overtake him, he closed the door. Michael Schumacher very firmly closing the door, leaving Hakkinen nowhere to go at all. Hakkinen had the speed, he didn't have anywhere to use it. And I tried many laps to overtake him, and every time he was able to close the door. And I said, OK, I had only a few laps left, so now I have to go for it. So in qualification in Spa, you go a rules, you go flat. You know, you don't lift, you go flat. And but in a race configuration, you cannot do it because the car is heavy, the tires not any more fresh. And I thought, if I want to overtake him, I have to do it flat. So I said, that's it, I'm going to make a risk. And it was an amazing feeling through the rules. And I thought, I thought the car was going to explode. You know, the pressure was so hard because the car was heavy. And I nearly flew coming out of the rules. And I saw that way, that's it, I'm catching him so easy now. And then I see there's a back marker. Zonda. Said, uh -huh. yeah. yeah, Ricardo Zonda. And I thought, like, what's going to happen now? <laughs> because every time Michael was closing the inside, inside road, you know, inside, inside of the track, and I thought, OK. But now he cannot do it, because Ricardo is there, so I have to take past the Ricardo inside, but I knew that way, if the Ricardo don't see us in the mirror and he suddenly moves inside or outside, it we are history, basically. I said, OK, let's go for it. I think they're going to pass Zonta on another part of the racetrack because that's what gives Hakkinen his best shot. Schumacher in dirty air and then Hakkinen with the extra straight line speed. And once again, look, Michael's having to defend and Mika and there's a, but the back markers in the way. But can he do and it? Yes, he's done it. A brilliant move there, either side of Zonta and Hakkinen brilliantly takes the lead of the Belgian Grand Prix. And you can see the delight in the McLaren garage because that could well have decided the race. A superb, gritty, determined, forceful move from Mika Hakkinen takes the lead in the McLaren Mercedes. It was an unbelievable feeling, you know. And uh, I think when I overtook Michael, he gave up. He thought, that's it. This, this was already <laughs> too much for him too, you know. <laughs> it was a good battle. We had great races together, very tough races, and and uh, we never, never, we never didn't start fighting in the in the media that way. You know, he's doing that, he's doing that. No, we always. That was important, wasn't it? I I felt it was so important because it was we solved the problems on the track. You clearly have some fun, clearly have some respect, and life is fun uh, for you now. And uh, you're involved with the development of young drivers. Yeah. And uh, what? is your impression of the talent that's out there on the grid at the moment and the kind of talent that's coming through as well? It, at the moment, the Formula One, it's, it's an amazing uh, uh, situation. I mean, you have many world champions, you had young drivers. Uh, I would say in my time, there was a 30%, 40% of the drivers were very serious and very motivated and, and, and very physical condition, but now, Nearly all of them are very focused. They have very good program of fitness or, or uh, uh, nutrition and, and uh, understanding traveling, how long time it takes to recover before you start driving when you travel to Australia, for example. So it's different these days and it's very competitive. Young drivers, they are much more aware of technical side of the cars. Uh, and, and uh, they are just, I don't, I don't say they're better than we used to be, <laughs> but what I'm just saying, they, the knowledge, uh, what is available, it's much more detailed and much easier to get. And one young driver in particular, you're getting a lot of fun out of the progress of your son, who's, who's looking good in karts, I think. Yeah, my, my, son is, my son has been doing karting 
since he was six years old, and 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 it's very interesting. It it takes me back in time, uh, and and it's to be a be a dad, be a son, starting his career. It make me understand how difficult it was my parents to educate me to be a racing driver, and and. Uh, all the time I have to remind myself that way it is it is fun, you know, for my son. You know, this is just a hobby. Yes. Uh, it's not serious. Uh, but what helps you have to have a good sense of humor in a business. Good communication, good sense of humor, and look positive side of it, you know. Mika, thanks very much for some wonderful memories of a of a great, great career. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.